stand up for a minute, go for it. <laughs> I am uh, I'm going to read one of my, from one of uh, my favorite authors, Isabel Allende. This is one of, uh, I think, the first short story in the stories of Eva Luna. It's called Two Words. She went by the name of Belisa Crepusculario. Not because she had been baptized with that name or given it by her mother, but because she herself had searched until she found the poetry of beauty and twilight and she cloaked herself in it. She made her living selling words. She journeyed through the country from the high cold mountains to the burning coasts, stopping at fairs and in markets where she set up four poles covered by a canvas awning under which she took refuge from the sun and rain to minister to her customers. She did not have to peddle her merchandise because from having wandered far and near, everyone knew who she was. Some people waited for her from one year to the next, and when she appeared in the village with her bundle beneath her arm, they would form a long line in front of her stall. Her prices were fair. For five centavos, she delivered verses from memory. For seven, she improved the quality of dreams. <laughs> for twelve, she invented insults for irreconcilable enemies. <laughs> she also sold stories. Not fantasies, but long, true stories that she recited in one telling, never skipping a word. This is how she carried views from one town to another. People take her to add a line or two. Oh, our son was born, so and so died, our children got married, the crops burned in the fields. Wherever she went, a small crowd gathered around to listen as she began to speak, and that was how they learned about each other's doings, about distant relatives, about what was going on in the Civil War. To anyone who paid her 50 centavos in trade, she gave the gift of a secret word to drive away melancholy. <laughs> It was not the same word for everyone, naturally, because that would have been collective <laughs> deceit. <laughs> Each person received his or her own word, with the assurance that no one else would ever use that word in that way in this universe or the beyond. Benita Crepusculario had been born into a family so poor that they didn't even have names to give their children. <laughs> she came into the world and grew up in an inhospitable land where some years the rains became avalanches of water that bore everything away before them and other years when not a drop fell from the sky and the sun set to fill the horizon and the world became a desert. Until she was 12, Belisa had no occupation or virtue other than having withstood hunger and the exhaustion of centuries. During one interminable drought, it fell to her to bury four younger brothers and sisters. When she realized her turn was next, she decided to set out across the plains in the direction of the sea in hopes that she might trick death along the way. Belisa Crepusculario saved her life. And in the process, she accidentally discovered writing. In a village near the coast, the wind blew a page of newspaper at her feet. She picked it up, pricked up the yellow paper, and stood a long while looking at it, unable to determine its purpose. Uh, she went over to a man washing his horse. Uh, what is this? She asked. <laughs> a sports page of the newspaper. The man replied, concealing his surprise at her ignorance. The answer astounded the girl, but she did not want to seem rude, so she merely inquired about the significance of the fly specks scattered all over the page. <laughs> Those are words, child. That was the day that Belisa Crepusculario found out that words make their way in the world without a master and that anyone with a little cleverness can appropriate them and do business with them. 
She made a quick assessment of her situation and concluded that aside from becoming a prostitute or working as a servant in the kitchens of the rich, there were few occupations she was qualified for. It seemed to her that selling words would be an honorable alternative. From that moment on, she worked in that profession and was never tempted by any other. One August morning, several years later, Felice Musculado was sitting in her tent in the middle of a plaza surrounded by the uproar of market day. Suddenly, she heard yelling and thudding hoofbeats. She looked up from her writing and saw first a cloud of dust and then a band of horsemen come galloping into the plaza. They were the colonel's men, sent under the orders of El Mulato, a giant known throughout the land for the speed of his knife and his loyalty to his chief. Both the colonel and El Mulato had spent their lives fighting in the Civil War, and their names were ineradicably linked to devastation and calamity. The rebels swept into town like a stampeding herd, wrapped in noise, bathed in sweat, and leaving a hurricane of fear in their wake. Chickens took wing, dogs ran for their lives, women and children scurried out of sight until the only living soul left in the plaza was Belisa Crepusculario. She had never seen El Mulato and she was surprised to see him walking toward her. I am looking for you. He shouted, pointing his coiled whip at her. Even before the words were out, two men rushed her. They knocked her over the canopy and shattered her inkwell. They bound her hand and foot and they threw her like a sea bag over the rump of El Mulato's mount. Then they thundered toward the hills. Hours later, just as Belisa de Musculario was near death, her heart ground to sand by the pounding of the horse. They stopped and four strong hands set her down. She tried to stand on her feet and hold her head high, but her strength failed her and she slumped to the ground, sinking into a confused dream. She awakened several hours later to the murmur of night in the camp. And she found herself staring into the impatient glare of El Mulato kneeling beside her. Well, woman, at last you come to to speed her to her senses, he tipped his canteen and offered her a sip of liquor laced with gunpowder. She demanded to know the reason for such rough treatment, and then Mulato said that the colonel needed her services. Then he led her to the far end of the camp, where the most feared man in all the land was living in a hammock strung between two trees. She could not see his face because he lay in the deceptive shadow of the leaves and in all the shadows of the years as a bandit, but she imagined from the way his gigantic aid addressed him with such humility that he must have a very menacing expression. She was surprised by the colonel's voice, as soft and well-modulated as the professor's. Are you the woman who says words? He asked. Uh, at, at your service. She stammered, peering into the dark and trying to see him better. The colonel stood up. He turned straight toward her. She saw a dark skin and the eyes of a ferocious puma, and she knew immediately that she was standing before the loveliest man in the world. I want to be president, he announced. The colonel was weary of riding across that godforsaken land, waging useless wars and suffering defeats that no subterfuge could transform into victories. For years, he had been sleeping in the open air, bitten by mosquitoes, eating iguanas and snake soup. But those minor inconveniences were not why he wanted to change his destiny. What truly troubled him was the fear that he saw in people's eyes. He longed to ride in a town beneath a triumphal arch with bright flags and flowers everywhere. He wanted to be cheered, to be given newly laid eggs and freshly baked bread. Men fled at the sight of him now. Children trembled, women miscarried from fright. 
he had had enough. And so he decided to become president. And Mulatto had suggested that they ride to the capital, gallop up to the palace, and take the government like the way they always did. <laughs> the colonel, however, did not want to be just another tyrant. There had been enough of those before him, and besides, if he did that, he would never win people's hearts. It was his aspiration to win the popular vote in the December elections. To do that, I have to talk like a candidate. Can you send me the words for a speech? Benita Gre Posculario had accepted many assignments, uh, but none like this. Uh, she did not dare refuse, fearing that a mulatto would shoot her between the eyes, or worse still, that the colonel would burst into tears. There was more to it than that, however. She felt the urge to help him because she felt a throbbing warmth beneath her skin, a powerful desire to touch that man, to fondle him, to clasp him in her arms. All night, and a good part of the following day, Benisa Musculario searched her repertory for words adequate for a presidential speech, closely watched by El Mulato, who could not take his eyes from her firm, wanderer's legs and her virginal breasts. She could start in harsh, cold words, words that were too flowery, words worn from abuse, words that offered improbable promises, untruthful and confusing words until all she had left were words sure to touch the minds of men and women's intuition. <coughs> she wrote a speech on a sheet of paper, and then she signaled El Mulato to untie the rope that bound her ankles to a tree. She led her once more, he led her once more to the colonel, and again she felt that throbbing anxiety that had seized her when she first saw him. She handed him the paper, what the shit does this say? <laughs> uh, don't you know how to read? She asked. War is what I know, he replied. So she read the speech aloud. She read it three times so her client could engrave it on his memory. When she finished, she saw the emotion in the faces of the soldiers who had gathered around to listen. And the, she saw that the colonel's eyes glittered with enthusiasm, convinced that with these words, the presidential chair would be his. All right, woman. How much do I owe you? The leader asked. One peso, colonel. That's not much, he said. The peso entitles you to a bonus. I'm going to give you two secret words, she said. What for? She explained that for every 50 centavos the client paid, she gave him the gift of a word for his excuse of use. The colonel shrugged. He had no interest at all in her offer, but he did not want to be impolite to someone who had served him so well. She walked slowly to the leather stool where he was sitting, and he and she bent down to give him her gift. The man smelled the scent of a mountain cat issuing from the woman, a fiery heat radiating from her hips. He heard the terrible whisper of her hair, and a breath of sweet mint murmured into his ear the two secret words that they were his alone. They are yours, Colonel, she said. She stepped back. You may use them as much as you please. 